All right, in this video, we are gonna finish up the chemistry chapter. Uh, and so last time we left off talking about carbohydrates. So now we're gonna talk about fats. Okay, and so carbohydrates um, are polar, all right? Sugars are polar. You know that if you put sugar in like coffee or tea and you stir it, that sugar will dissolve. So sugars, carbohydrates are polar. Fats are nonpolar. All right, or we say that they are hydrophobic, just meaning that they don't like water. Okay, so hydrophobic, they don't like water, whereas carbohydrates would be hydrophilic, meaning they do uh, dissolve in water. Okay, so some uh, functions of fats just in general, and we'll talk about the functions for each type are um, for protection. All right, so we'll see that fats can form the boundaries of cells that'll provide protection. Also, uh, in the sense of insulation uh, as like stored fat in our body provides protection. Energy storage, we know that. Uh, you can, you know, store fat for energy. Uh, as well as communication. There's a category of fats we'll talk about uh, that are used uh, and used to form hormones, right? So they're really important for communication as well. Okay, so let's start off with triglycerides. All right, so triglycerides would be uh, the kind of fats found, all right, in food. Okay, so this would be in food. Uh, and stored in the body. All right, so anywhere you have like fat deposits, uh, the, those are gonna be in the form of triglycerides, okay? And so with triglycerides, let's talk about those monomers, all right? And so with triglycerides, we have uh, two basic monomers. So we have this kind of backbone here, all right? Okay. And so this is, this backbone is glycerol. All right, and so I kind of, I call it a backbone because coming off of it, all right, are these three kind of tails here. Okay, so we have this backbone that's holding those three tails on. Those tails, all right, so we'll just mark off one of them here. All right, those tails are called fatty acids. Okay, so we have three, those three of those, all right, that's the tri part, the three part of a triglyceride. All right, we have three fatty acids and that one uh, glycerol backbone that those three fatty acids are attached to. Okay, uh, and so, these fatty acid tails can be variable in length, right? They, they're generally gonna be much longer than this. Uh, and so you can just see that they're just these string of carbons with hydrogens attached, right? So they're very simple. And you can see very clearly that carbon backbone that we're talking about with organic molecules, all right? Uh, and so you also probably have heard in reference to fats that there are saturated fats and there are unsaturated fats. So let's talk about the difference between those here. So with saturated fats, all right, what's going on with saturated fats is that every carbon has two hydrogens attached to it. All right, so on that fatty acid, each carbon has two hydrogens attached to it. All right, so this is a fully saturated fat. All right, so each carbon has two hydrogens, okay? All right, and so then with an unsaturated fat, all right, you can see that, no, you can't see because this is not drawn right. So we drew the double bond in, but if we were being accurate, let me just uh, block this out, right? This guy would not have this hydrogen, this guy would not have this hydrogen, all right? 
this was just my, you know, making it and not paying attention, make it in a hurry. All right, so you can see with this now corrected uh, unsaturated fat that each carbon, all right, so each of these carbons have its two hydrogens. However, when we get to these two carbons, all right, there's actually a double bond between those carbons and they only each have one hydrogen attached. So they're not saturated with hydrogens, right? They're unsaturated. And um, this, the, this kind of double bond is the important part here because what it does when you add that double bond is you kind of add like a little notch, right? To that fatty acid, right? You cause it to bend, you add a bend to it. Okay, so it's no longer straight once you add that double bond. Okay, and so that kind of gives the structural difference to these two fats, all right? So if I ask you for examples of a uh, saturated fat, all right, that would be some examples of that if we're just thinking like saturated fats in the kitchen would be things like bacon grease, butter, um, coconut oil is one of them. Uh, so those are things that are, they're fats, but they're solid at room temperature. All right, so saturated fats are solid at room temperature. And that's because these fatty acid tails are so straight. So you can just take this fatty acid tail, stack it directly next to another fatty acid tail and another one there and another one there and another one there, right? They can kind of all stack up together very neatly, making that fat more solid, right? You can kind of pack in many more of these fatty acid molecules together, making us fat solid at room temperature. However, with these unsaturated fats, and some examples would be fats with, um, let's add a little definition here. Uh, there's a double bond between carbons. Whoops. Okay. And so some examples of this would be any fat that's liquid at room temperature. So olive oil would definitely be, all right, avocado oil, um, corn oil. So any kind of oil that stays liquid at room temperature. Okay. All right. So liquid at room temperature. Uh, and so that is because of this double bond that's been introduced. So now, instead of being able to pack nicely in together, what happens is you have this fatty acid with a curve to it, and then this fatty acid, and then this one has a curve, and then this one has a curve. They can't sit next to each other nicely. So they tend to kind of space out more, all right? And then you need this one kind of down here, all right? They need a little more space, and that space is what makes them liquid at room temperature, okay? So saturated fats, no double bonds, right? Nice and straight. These are gonna be solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fats have double bonds between carbons. That makes them kind of crooked, right? And they're gonna be liquid at room temperature, okay? All right. So these are our um, triglycerides. So one other interesting thing to point out with these, since this is the type of fat that's in most of the foods that we eat uh, and how it's stored in the body, um, it's interesting to talk about, and it'll be really important when you get into the digestive system, how these fats are transported in the blood, okay? Because we know they're nonpolar, all right? Actually, let's make this green so it kind of stands out. So we know they're not polar, which means that they don't mix with water. So they can't just, you can't just send a triglyceride floating out in the blood, right? It needs to be able to dissolve in the blood, in the water of the blood. Okay, so um, we'll just say transport in blood. Okay, so how is that possible? So what actually happens with these fats is that they are wrapped 
in a, a polar kind of protein coat. All right, so they're wrapped in polar proteins. Think of maybe those polar proteins as like bubble wrap, totally surrounding that triglyceride so that it is now protected, right? Its whole outer surface is polar on the outside because it's covered with these polar proteins. Okay, and so these are called lipoproteins. Right, and you will see lipoproteins uh, again when you talk about um, digestion and how fats are absorbed and transported in the body. Okay, so that's triglycerides. So our next category of lipids is going to be a phospholipid. All right, and so phospholipids are kind of similar um, to our triglycerides, right? We actually have only two right fatty acid tails here and they can be saturated or unsaturated uh, and then we have the phospho part of a phospholipid is this part here all right we have a polar phosphate head all right you can see that phosphorus in there makes it a phosphate head and it's polar, which means it actually can dissolve in water. All right, and so this is another fatty acid. Oops, see Daisy? All right, okay. And so um, it has the polar heads, all right, the fatty acids, and it, that is really, really important for its function because its function is to form that phospholipid bilayer, right? This is just the plasma membrane, right? Is another name for it around cells, right? That cell membrane. And so this is what uh, a phospholipid bilayer looks like. So it's just um, kind of like a layer, right? Of phospholipids. And it's actually two layers. So bi means two. So we can see, let's just zoom in a little bit. All right, we have, whoops, one phospholipid here and one here. So what we're doing is we're drawing as our phospholipids like this with these little tails. And some of them are kind of crooked because they're unsaturated. All right, so this would be our polar head, that polar phosphate head. All right, and then these two guys hanging off of it are going to be the fatty acids. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, and so with this phospholipid bilayer, uh, the reason that structure of the phospholipid is so important, let's get this to fit, all right, is we want those polar parts, all right, so these polar heads to be pointing out towards the watery either outside of the cell or the watery inside of the cell. All right, so we're gonna have the polar part. We'll say polar uh, is on the edges. All right. And then you have this kind of like, we'll do this in green here, this kind of central core here, all right, that is non-polar in the middle. Okay, and so that actually is gonna help to make that barrier for our cells. And we're going to talk about the cells in another chapter. All right, but it helps to make that barrier for the cells in the middle. So then you don't have a uh, simple diffusion of, you know, polar things, water and that kind of stuff straight through the cell. So the cell can maintain the uh, environment on the inside of the cell can be completely different from the environment on the outside of the cell because you have this kind of layer of fat completely surrounding it. All right, and so we'll talk more about this with our cell chapter two. Okay, but that's phospholipids. All right, they form that outer membrane on cells. All right, our next category of fats is gonna be steroid fats. 
all right? And so steroid fats um, are going to be derived from, uh, either include cholesterol or they're derived from cholesterol, okay? And so they have this kind of ring structure, so very different than our other fats with those fatty acid tails, but they have these multiple rings, right, connected to each other. Uh, so this actually is cholesterol here, all right? And then we can have some other things that are derived from these steroid fats, um, especially particularly hormones, right? There are some steroid hormones, like the sex hormones, so estrogen and testosterone would fall into these categories. Testosterone, all right, uh, as well as cortisol. I'll just add that one here, which is a stress hormone, okay? So very important fat. Um, cholesterol also, the cholesterol is really important actually with this phospholipid bilayer. So you'll have these little bits of cholesterol kind of embedded in this cell membrane and it helps with the structure of that membrane. So it makes it a little more rigid, all right? So the cells can have a shape to them. Okay, so cholesterol can be in the cell membrane and it also can be made to use these really important hormones. All right, then our last category of fat is eicosanoids. All right, and so just briefly about these, uh, eicosanoids are derived from essential fats. All right, these are gonna be the omega fats. All right, look like omega, uh, like omega-3 and that kind of thing uh, that are supposed to be really important in your diet. Um, omega-3 and 6, right? Omega fatty acids. So they're derived from those. Uh, and one example would be that they're used to make, whoopsie, there we go, prostaglandins. Okay, two important functions of prostaglandins are going to be in blood clotting. All right, and we'll learn about that next semester when you learn about blood. Uh, and they're really important for inflammation, which inflammation does serve a very important function uh, with your immune system, right? Uh, and so um, part of that infl inflammatory process is going to involve prostaglandins. Okay. Our third major category of organic molecules is proteins. Okay. And so proteins, our monomer, all right, is going to be the amino acid. Okay. So our monomer for proteins is amino acids, right? So amino acids are the little building blocks that we make proteins out of. Uh, there are 20 different types of amino acids. Only 10 of those 20 are essential, okay? And so by essential, we mean that they must be in your diet. All right. That because there are 10 that your body can synthesize on its own. It can make itself, but there are 10 that it cannot. And so that means you have to actually eat foods that contain those essential amino acids. Okay. All right. So when we take two amino acids and we link them together, the bond bef between them that forms is called a peptide bond. Um, and so that bond is formed by dehydration synthesis. All right, so we're gonna form that peptide bond between two amino acids by dehydration synthesis. And so you can kind of see in this diagram pretty easily, right? If we just take these two pieces here together, all right, we remove them as a water. And now we have a bond between this carbon and this nitrogen here, okay? So that's our peptide bond. Right, and we did that by removing water, right? Dehydration synthesis. Okay. 
And so with proteins, a really important concept to understand is the different levels of structure to a protein. Okay, so in proteins we have, we start with our primary structure. All right, and so the primary structure of a protein is just the order, uh, the amino acids are, let's just say, connected in. Okay. All right, so just the fact that amino acid A is connected to amino acid W, V, T, and then P. That order, all right, is called the primary structure. So it's just like reading a sentence, has no shape to it or anything like that. All right, it's just what order are those amino acids in? So this order is determined by DNA. All right, so DNA holds the blueprints for how to put proteins together, how to link amino acids to each other, what order they go in. All right, so once you have amino acids attached to each other in that primary structure, they then start to fold, okay? And so they start to fold by forming uh, kind of hydrogen bonds between the different components of the amino acids. All right and um, they can form two different structures. So they can form an alpha helix, all right? And so that's gonna have kind of a, kind of, you know, spiral shape like that, an alpha helix, or they can form a beta pleated sheet, which is kind of this like corrugated cardboard or metal, right? This, you know, little pointy kind of wave, okay? Before we move on, one thing I forgot to mention was kind of this, the actual structure of the amino acid. So we're gonna label a couple parts, okay, that are really important. So <clears throat> when we look at one amino acid, so this would be one, whoops, one amino acid, all right? So they're all gonna be uh, exactly the same in their structure, except this component right here is gonna be different between each of the 20 amino acids. And so that is called the variable region. And so it can be extremely different, all right? You can have variable regions that are polar, you can have variable regions that are nonpolar, you can have some that are charged, uh, either positively or negatively, or they can be totally neutral. Uh, so they can make each amino acid very, very different just depending on what that variable region is. And so that's why when we're forming the secondary structure, all right, we would have these different variable regions interacting with each other, forming hydrogen bonds to make these shapes. Okay, and then one other structure on an amino acid to point out uh, is this part here, all right, the part with the nitrogen in it is called the amine group. All right, so this is the amine group. Okay, uh, and so it's the part with the nitrogen. Um, if your body is breaking down proteins, right, and breaking down amino acids, um, this amine group is removed, okay, and then it actually becomes ammonia, which is converted to urea. So the urea in your urine is actually from the breakdown of this amine from amino acids. Okay, back to our structure. All right, so we have our primary structure, which is just what order are the amino acids in. The secondary structure, we're starting to get some shapes. All right, so those two shapes are alpha helices or singular and alpha helix. All right. Uh, and then beta pleated sheets. Okay. Then our tertiary structure can form. Okay, and so this tertiary structure is we're gonna take all of those shapes as either alpha helices or beta pleated sheets and start folding them in on each other. So if you can kind of imagine, all right, this is showing our tertiary structure here. All right, there could be an alpha helix running through here. All right, there could be a little beta pleated sheet running through here. And we're going to take all those and fold them on top of each other. Okay, so this level has a very specific 
3D shape. And this tertiary structure is absolutely critical for function uh, of that protein. Essential for function. Okay, so if a um, protein loses that shape, all right, it can no longer function. And so that's actually a really important thing you guys should know. So if a protein loses its shape, we say that it is denatured. Okay, so a denatured protein, uh, loss of shape, equals a loss of function. All right, and so a couple things that can cause proteins to lose their shape, this three-dimensional tertiary structure, is going to be um, changes in pH. All right, like we talked about, we have that very strict pH homeostasis in order to protect our proteins, okay? And then another thing we keep in a very strict homeostasis in the body is temperature. Because changing that temperature too much, if you have a fever over a very long period of time, it can be dangerous, especially if it's a really high fever, because you can start to denature proteins. And denatured proteins don't always return to their shape, right? Once the temperature goes back down, uh, this protein is not necessarily going to fold back in its original shape, right? And that's why you can get some permanent damage from uh, an extended, really high fever. Okay. All right, so denaturing of proteins would be losing this very special tertiary structure that's needed for its function. Okay, and so proteins can be either globular, which would be this guy here, Right, so really globular, we're going to use some fancy words here to, divide, to uh, define these. Globular would be blob-shaped, all right, like this guy, right, kind of blob-shaped, versus fibrous is more kind of like a string shape, okay? And this would be a lot of structural proteins that like make up the kind of skeleton on the inside of the cell, all right, would have this kind of, they even kind of are usually woven kind of like this, right? Have this fibrous shape like that, a string shape, okay? All right, so a lot of proteins just need this tertiary structure. They stop here, that's it, all right? So for example, insulin would be an example of this. They just need this one tertiary structure. They're good to go and do its function. So insulin can go and do its job. However, some proteins are a little more complex and they have a quaternary structure, okay? And so this example of a quaternary structure here is hemoglobin, all right? So hemoglobin uh, has these four, so this would be like one subunit, all right? And it has these four separate tertiary structures, okay? So this is going to be separate tertiary structures interacting. All right, connected to each other. Okay, uh, so yeah, so this example would be hemoglobin. So it has four separate structures interacting, all right? And so you need all four of those structures for hemoglobin to function properly. It couldn't function with just three, right, or two. You have to have all four. Okay. Uh, and so I got a little ahead of myself, right, on denatured. So uh, we already talked about denaturing, okay? So that is proteins are denatured they lose their function. Okay, let's talk about some kind of general functions of proteins.
All right, and many of these functions we'll talk about um, later in the semester and even next semester as well as we see, you know, actual examples of those functions. Uh, so first of all, there are hormones that are made out of amino acids or even, you know, small proteins. All right, so there's hormones made from proteins. Uh, movement, we're going to learn that this semester. Movement in general relies heavily on proteins. So muscle contraction involves uh, a series of proteins in order for a muscle to be able to contract. Um, structure in general involves proteins. This could be structure within a cell giving it a shape or uh, like the structure of bone relies heavily on proteins like collagen as well as the structure of like your fingernails, right? And your hair is keratin, which is also a protein. And as we just saw in our last example, oxygen transport, which is done by hemoglobin that we looked at, right? Which is a protein. And then lastly, we have our big category uh, of functional proteins, and that is gonna be enzymes. Okay, so enzymes we're gonna see over and over and over and over again um, throughout both semesters of this class. And enzymes are catalysts. So that means that their function is to speed up reactions. All right, so they make reactions happen at a rate that is useful for an actual cell. A lot of reactions will happen on their own normally, um, but it'd be too slow for uh, a cell, right? Okay, and one way to recognize enzymes is that they all, Alex, lay down now. And so one way, one way to recognize enzymes, right, or that you're learning about an enzyme, is that they all end in ACE, all right? So that's at the end. So for example, um, the enzyme to break down our disaccharide we learned about lactose is called lactase. Okay, so it ends in ACE, A-S-E. That ending always means you're looking at uh, an enzyme. A couple other really important functions of enzymes or kind of characteristics, not really functions, characteristics of enzymes. Uh, in addition to them being catalysts, they have a specific shape. Right? And that's because they are proteins. Proteins have a specific shape, and that shape is important for their function. For enzymes, this shape acts kind of as like a lock, um, let's say lock and key. Okay, so for example, the enzyme that breaks down lactose would have a special shape that is made to fit only lactose, right? So lactase would have this kind of little binding pocket, right? If I were to draw it, maybe it'll look like this with a little square binding pocket, which doesn't look as square as I meant it to, right? And our little lactose will fit perfectly into that spot. So it has a specific shape that is made to bind to whatever it is going to be interacting with. All right, so enzymes are very uh, specific. They only catalyze one type of reaction. All right, so lactase would break down lactose, but it would not break down maltose, all right? So they're extremely specific for one type of reaction. All right, enzymes are also reusable.
So lactase could break down a lactose molecule and move on to the next lactose and break it down as well. All right, and then lastly, because they are proteins, right, they have an optimal pH and temperature that they like to function in. Uh, and so this can actually be different depending on the enzyme we're talking about. So, um, for example, in your stomach, there are enzymes that break down proteins, right, called pepsin, and they don't even function until they're in the presence of a very acidic kind of HCL filled environment. So they actually require a very low pH in order to function versus some, you know, maybe working in the blood might just require that 7.35 to 4.5 pH. Okay, so that's our proteins, enzymes being our big category of proteins that are really important. All right, then our last group of organic molecules is nucleic acids. So nucleic acids consist of DNA and RNA, all right, so the Na for each of them being nucleic acid. So we have either deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid. And that just depends on the sugar that's present. Okay. Uh, and so when we look at a nucleic acid, all right, this is what each nucleic acid looks like. So it has a phosphate oops, portion, all right, so it has a phosphate, it has that sugar, so it's either deoxyribose or ribose, and then it has a um, nitrogenous base, that would be this part. So this nitrogenous base is what's going to be different between each uh, type of nucleic acid. Okay. Um, all right, and so this whole thing, that'd be another thing to point out, right, is referred to as a nucleotide. So that refers to the phosphate with the sugar and the nitrogenous base. Okay. All right. And so when we arrange DNA together, right, it forms a double helix, okay? And you guys have probably heard this before, right? Or at least you've seen a picture of DNA. So DNA, right, just the double part means that you would have, here we go, two st separate strands, right? It's double-stranded. So you have one strand with its nucleotides, right? And these would be the little kind of bars coming off are the nitrogenous bases. And then you have the other side that would kind of correspond to it, all right, with its nitrogenous bases. So that's the double part, there's two strands. And then the helix is that if you take this kind of ladder structure and you twist that ladder, all right, it has kind of a, a twisted shape to it, right? So it has kind of like a wavy shape, right, like this, okay then you would have those kind of rungs in the middle like this. All right, so that's our double helix shape. Okay, there are four types of nitrogenous bases here. All right, so they can either have just one single ring or they can have two rings like this, okay? And so those four nitrogenous bases, you should know the names, you don't have to worry about the number of rings, all right? But they are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine, okay? And they do pair to each other. So if you have, let's say, cytosine here on this blue part, it will always be paired to its counterpart, which is guanine on the red, okay? So these two are paired together. Always cytosine and guanine, and always adenine and thymine, okay? All right, 
And so these DNA, we said before when we were talking about proteins, that primary structure of the protein is coded for by the DNA. So let's talk about how that happens, all right? And so let me put underneath these. We usually just abbreviate these with single letters. So C, G, A, and T, all right? And so if we just had kind of a series of uh, some nu uh, nucleic acids put together, C, C, G, T, C, A, A. Okay. Uh, the way that this series of nucleic acids will actually code for a protein is that it does it in threes. So every grouping of three nucleic acids will equal one amino acid. All right, so it's like ATT would stand for a specific amino acid, and it would tell the cell, you're gonna start with this acid, amino acids, we'll just call it amino acid one. You're gonna link it to the next one, which is amino acid two, or you know, amino acid 12, right? Just depending on the protein we're talking about. And then you're gonna link that to the next amino acid, okay? So these series of three nucleotides that code for one protein are called codons. All right, so three nucleic acids, which equals one amino acid. Okay, so every three nucleic acid tells the cell a specific amino acid to add. There we go. All right, so that's DNA, and that's how DNA codes for proteins. So every three nucleic acid codes for a single amino acid that's gonna be added to that primary structure. All right. So primarily here, we've been talking about with these four nitrogenous bases, and the double-stranded, the double helix, that's all DNA. So RNA is a little different. Uh, so it has a different sugar, all right? Uh, the sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose, all right? RNA is also single-stranded, so it would only have either, you know, this blue part here, right, or the red. It doesn't have both. It's single-stranded. Okay, and the other major difference is that it replaces uh, thymine with uracil. All right, uracil just abbreviated with a U instead of thymine. Okay, and then RNA does have many different functions other than DNA. So DNA codes for proteins. However, RNA has a lot of different functions um, that we'll learn about, or we're not gonna actually get into the nitty gritty details, but it's involved in making proteins. All right, so uh, we'll just say functions. All right, you may have heard of uh, messenger RNA, all right? Uh, that's actually how, you know, you make a copy of this sequence, take it out of the cell to the actual components of the cell, the ribosomes that can make the proteins. That copy is called uh, messenger RNA. Ribosomes themselves that we're going to learn about in our cell chapter are made of RNA. It's called rRNA. Okay, and then there are components um, called tRNA, all right, that are going to bring when this sequence says, you know, this codes for amino acid number one, this tRNA brings that amino acid number one over to the ribosome, all right. So many other functions, they don't code for proteins uh, like DNA does, though, okay, all right. So we have one additional topic. This is not a big category of organic molecules, but it is an organic molecule, okay? And it is ATP, and it is extremely important for uh, you to understand what ATP does. So ATP 
all right, adenosine triphosphate. It's actually made from the adenine, okay? So this A part here, this adenosine part, is made out of this adenine here, okay? So you have that kind of adenine nucleotide, all right, attached to three phosphates. And this molecule provides the uh, energy uh, for different cell processes, all right? Anything in the cell um, that needs to be done is going to require energy. So that energy in ATP comes from this high energy bond. All right, it's kind of stored in that high energy bond between the second and the third phosphate. So if we break that bond, we're gonna release that energy. Okay, and so that's what we have here uh, on our reaction, right? So if we hydrolyze, right, hydrolysis, adding water to break a bond and break that bond, uh, we're gonna release that energy. And so we end up with ADP, all right, so this just means two right, phosphates, adenosine diphosphate, our free phosphate, and that energy release that we can now use to do different functions, okay? All right, and then ATP is made in the mitochondria. All right, organelle we're gonna learn about in our next chapter. And it's stored in the cytoplasm. So it's just there available uh, for any function the cell needs it for, okay? All right, so just remember the important part with ATP is when you break this high energy bond, all right, you're gonna release that energy and then you're left with adenosine diphosphate, this little free floating phosphate and that energy you released, okay? All right, so that's the end for the chemistry chapter.